Hello, I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia University School of Social Work. I'm pleased to have here today, on the 18th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, Dr. Ellen Lukens and Dr. Hella Torning. Dr. Torning is a research scientist and the director of the ACT Institute, Assertive Community Treatment of the New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University. She's also a clinical professor of psychiatric social work at the Columbia University Vagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons. Dr. Lukens is the Sylvia D. and Mose J. Firestone Centennial Professor of Professional Practice here at the Columbia School of Social Work. Dr. Lukens and Dr. Torning, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks on New York City, Dr. Lukens, Dr. Torning, and Dr. Peggy O'Neill, uh, a good friend and former colleague of ours, now teaching at Smith College School for Social Work, worked with a team of social work clinicians to develop and implement a psychoeducational intervention for those individuals and families directly affected. Based on their prior expertise in helping people deal with trauma, mental illness, and other significant challenges. But before we turn to that intervention, I wonder if we might pause for a moment to reflect on that day, September 11th, and where we were. Um, thanks, Richard, and thanks for having us, inviting us to do this. Um, so that morning, September 11th, um, I was teaching my doctoral class, which I usually do from 9 to 11 on Tuesday mornings, and it was a large class. It was the second session, and we didn't take a break during class, so we were in, involved in an intense discussion. So after the class was over, I walked back to my office. People in the next room were huddled around a radio looking horrified, and one of them ran out to, and gra literally grabbed me and tried to explain what had happened. It was very hard to absorb, and my first thoughts went to my daughter, who was fourth day of freshman year of high school, very close to the World Trade Site, and my husband, who had just flown from New York to Atlanta for business. Uh, and, and then just trying to figure out in the midst of an, a sort of unprecedented experience and reaction what to do next. Mm. So, yeah. well, I'm glad. Thank you again also for having us. And, and I think it's a very good question to start with because on a day like today, you know, we, all of us, are sort of thinking about uh, where we were mm -hmm. and, and what happened and, and also sort of reflecting on the impact that it has had, not just on us, but on, 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 uh, on, the, on our country. Uh, so, yeah, I was the director of social work at the time and at New York State Psychiatric Institute, so uh, also heard the, uh, the news sort of uh, from a colleague, uh, but couldn't really absorb it either and, and started to go about my, the, day, you know, the business of the day, uh, and then I realized what was going on. Um, and then my kids also uh, in New York City, you were thinking about where are they, where is your family, uh, obviously kids and your husband is, is sort of forefront of your, of your mind. Um, but at that moment it was also an interesting kind of experience because I had to kind of turn over the concern um, for my children and to my husband uh, and I was lucky to get in, in, in touch with him. Uh, and uh, and then I had to uh, uh, kind of go on trying to think about what my role was uh, in my position at the hospital uh, and what was going to be ex expected of us. Um, so that was kind of the day full of uh, sort of this uh, having to turn off in a way what was going on with the family to think about sort of the work piece and, and that I was totally unprepared for. Mm. Yeah, um, to sort of pick up on your story, I was, I was a clinical social worker at the time at Memorial Hospital mm -hmm. um, of Sloan Kettering, and uh, like you, I was with my colleagues, and we were trying to get information um, about what was going on, and 
then we heard from hospital administration, um, from people like you, saying, well, we needed to mobilize um, for this uh, catastrophe. And uh, um, so we uh, tried to discharge as many patients as possible to open up beds. We were, you know, setting things up in hallways. Um, and we waited. Yeah. Um, and we waited. Yeah. And, and that's what I remember about the day. Um, the terrible realization that the it that the tragedy was so awful that uh, when you talk about casualties, we we didn't even have wounded mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to treat yeah. at yeah, our mentioned. hospital. Yeah. yeah, that was so. That's interesting. So we were both sort of off town, yeah. and I think the people that were uh, sort of. Be, you know, coming out from the from this site mm -hmm. and needing treatment, they had St. Vincent's, and they got the the people that needed the treatment. Yeah. But the, us from the rest of the city or uptown, we were just waiting. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the events of that day uh, reverberate um, to the present. Yeah. Um, and there's an interesting article in the New York Times. I don't know if you saw it about uh, a woman who. Uh, fled the towers um, that day and dealing with uh, PTSD now, um, 18 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it just um, underscores um, the importance, right, of trying to intervene, um, you know, early, as early as possible um, at the time of these kinds of events, um, which you were uh, in a position to do uh, back then. Um, you developed this intervention um, to help people directly affected. Um, I believe the was the program called Hope New York. Yeah. Uh, so the program. So we named the program Hope New York. Yeah. And that stood for healing and outreach through psychoeducation. Uh, but hope felt like a very critical component of the work at that point mm -hmm. because nationally people felt quite hopeless. Uh, so figuring out how to build on resilience in, in the context became really important. And then the names seemed, for us, symbolized that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you, you talk about the reverberations of the trauma 18 years later. It, it's gone very deep in terms of physical and, and psychological impact and the fact that people are still experiencing the aftermath. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it hasn't, and I think days like today bring that up for a lot of people mm -hmm. so yeah yeah so at that time what did hope new york try to do to kind of lessen the impact of the trauma of that day and uh, on the people affected i mean how did the how was the program set up and how did, how did it work and how did it start yeah <laughs> Uh, well, I think, Hella, actually, you called, soon after the event, you called me and said, you know, we've been doing psychoeducation with people with severe mental illness for many years, and it seems like this would be a really good approach for this event. Uh, and clearly it would require some adaptation as well. So the idea was to use the, the premise of psychoeducation, which is really a learning exchange between participants and facilitators, uh, to in, and to work with very, very diverse communities across the city. So, right. yeah. And I think that you, we were saying directly affected. So, so I just want to kind of okay, think about true. that a little that's bit, true. because in the, the first day of, or the first period of time after a traumatic event, like um, we saw at 9-11, and is that the first thing really that needs to happen is that the first responders have to step in. Uh, and I think, uh, and, and that's what we learned too, we were both reminiscing about that the first couple of days after the event, after we knew our kids and our family were safe, we were also then trying to think about, well, what is our role? What do we do? Um, and we did different things, uh, went down to the Red Cross, but really felt, couldn't quite find the space where, uh, you know, we were, uh, we could be helpful. Uh, so, so the first in any kind of traumatic uh, experience or event or when that happens, safety, of course, is first. The people have, we know that people need shelter, need food, they need to be safe. Um, and that's, that's, that's the first responders kind of job. 
what we start seeing is that there's sort of the next wave of things that people were uh, needing to figure out a way, as we ourselves, to understand what was going on and how the impact it has and to, to understand our reactions and to help uh, sort of use this idea or use uh, psychoeducation as a way of uh, explain, kind of helping people understand and help them make meaning out of this event for themselves. So this is kind of, so this is not a model for first responders, but this is a model for sort of the immediate aftermath for people who have had, who are in the community, mm -hmm. uh, close to the events, but really sort of impacted and significantly impacted, as just like with the woman you talked about who has, still has, suffers from PTSD uh, to this day, but that helping people to understand that the reactions that they had or they ha they were having or, um, or that emerge after an event like that mm. are very common reactions in very unusual events. Mm. And that's what what we wanted to kind of get at because that's what the, the uh, what people got concerned about that they would have these uh, problems or reactions for for a long, long time, mm -hmm. uh, but it's actually very common that you would have those kinds of stress reactions, and what can you do? Okay. So um, the uh, intervention was basically um, group meetings um, that were organized in different communities, yeah. um, consisting of, what, four sessions, I believe? Um, is that correct? No. So, yes. Okay. Uh, so, it, so as you said, and as you introduced us, we started Peggy O'Neill, Hella, and I mm. developed this initially, but it seemed quite disingenuous of us to attempt this work in communities around the city yeah. without involving the communities. Okay. And because there was significant funding available through Project Liberty and the September 11th Fund, we were able to have the, the dollars to hire people from the communities that we were working with that included the Arab American community, mm -hmm the Chinese American community, the Dominican American community, and the American Indian community, as well as um, uh, rescue workers. Um, and to adapt our model for each of these communities working in conjunction with people from the communities. Because trauma is understood very, very differently in different cultures. Yeah. Um, so it was a bit of a daunting task because, um, as Hella said, this was not something we could do immediately after uh, September 11th because people were dealing with the crisis. Mm -hmm. And it, it took a lot of collaboration with the communities to be able to develop the model. So, yeah. so this uh, provided you an opportunity to get um, some feedback from uh, the very communities that were affected and to build a, a to, to, to collaborate on, on developing uh, this intervention um, in a way that uh, um, gave them uh, agency, gave them a sense of uh, or a role um, in, in how it would be put together and, and how it would be uh, delivered, I guess. Yeah. And I think to add to that, that as we start working with people in these uh, four or five communities that we worked in, uh, it was with the people who were helping people. So we also became uh, keenly aware of the importance of uh, understanding impact on the helpers mm -hmm. who were helping in a traumatic situation after community trauma. Uh, who has also been impacted themselves. So the whole idea of vicarious trauma or secondary trauma really sort of rose to the surface and that I think one of the really big lessons of what we learned from, from the project of the importance for us uh, as social workers or help, as helpers to pay attention to how we are experiencing um, the, what we hear uh, because it might resonate with our own fears or worries uh, for ourselves and our families. Uh, so, the, so the distance between the helper and the priest, people being helped, uh, also that distance really, it, just, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the big lessons from, that we learned, I think, wouldn't you say, of, of what the impact of community trauma has uh, for everybody in the community. So we were really, it was really a process of not only healing in the work that we were doing, but healing ourselves right. in terms, because this was so, 
hard to grasp. It's still very difficult to understand that that really happened. Mm -hmm. And there are many you know, other kinds of traumas that are not dissimilar happening around the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, I think it's a wonderful approach, you know, to sort of, I don't want to say, you know, shift from an individual focus, but to look at it in more collective right. terms, right? And, 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 and sort of uh, a group response um, uh, that, uh, um, you know, would uh, promote uh, and foster resilience, right? And, and um, is more strength-based, um, certainly, um, as we like to talk about it in social work, you mm -hmm. know, um, as a response. So um, just uh, what were some of the topics that came up in actual discussions? Um, That's such a great question. I mean, some, some of the topics that came up in discussions were the, the most mundane things, mm -hmm. having to do with everyday rituals and how one's life was disrupted because of what had happened. What was expected in daily life was no longer... You, you couldn't exp you didn't know what what to think what happened next mm -hmm. and then other other some of the other discussions were much deeper focused on you know the the grief associated with losing a husband so su suddenly or a child an adult child um, so it ran the gamut in terms of and actually I think moving from the mundane to the more really deeply upsetting aspects within the groups was was healing in its own way for people mm -hmm. so yeah and then it was very what we also were you know kind of it was it's kind of an honor to be part mm -hmm. of the communities that had very yeah. different kinds of reactions uh, and uh, it meant different for 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 them so for example the Native American community now not many people know that there's a Native American very vital community in New York City mm -hmm and they have a community house and we were invited in uh, to participate in their uh, kind of as they were figuring out what to do for their members. Uh, but they had, so for, for many of, or there was a, the historically the Native American community were actually the iron workers who built the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. So they had a very strong connection to the World Trade Center itself. Uh, they were very proud of it. It became a, you know, that was sort of very proud because they were part of making it. Or building it mm -hmm. and then but at the same time they were also experiencing well wait a minute you know this is you know a, a tragedy a community trauma for New York City but what happened with our historical trauma as Native American people yeah. and so it so as Ellen said it touched on many different levels because it was uh, so nobody paid attention to uh, our trauma when we were in particular I remember one man talking about his trauma of being removed from his tribe um, to, um, you know, go to a Catholic school and, you know, being his culture being sort of, uh, he, him being stripped of his culture. Mm -hmm. And so that, so for, for that community, uh, it brought up, you know, a number of different, uh, particularly what we thought about the historical trauma and then thinking about, learning about how people think about that in that community in terms of uh, the, the way they make meaning. Um, so it was, it was a very, it was sort of a privileged position for us in a way, a very honored mm -hmm. to be able to, to, to hear and understand and get that perspective as we were, uh, as we were participating with them. Yeah. In the very first meeting with the Arab American community, mm -hmm. I remember we, we sort of presented our ideas and then we wanted to have an exchange with the group, which was probably some spiritual leaders and community members in Brooklyn and somebody raised their hand and said, are you from the FBI? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember my, my sort of my blood running cold and thinking, of course they would think that. Yeah. Of course they would think that. Yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of need for, you know, bridging the, the distrust and the fear and... Uh, yeah, so uh, obviously, um, you know, the effects of these kinds of events differs according right. to um, the community. The community. Uh, being considered, and uh, I just wonder, um, you know, if, if we can draw any lessons from your work after 9-11 to what mm -hmm. seems like an almost weekly, right, uh, event here in our country, whether it's a mass shooting or, uh, you know, devastation from uh, a hurricane or some kind of extreme, it, um, 
things that we might draw from that work that, that might help people uh, foster resilience, um, you know, manage um, what are potentially traumatic experiences? No, that's, it's, it's such a good question. I mean, one of the things that we learned is that people don't initially have the words to describe what happens mm. to them, and helping, which is an important part of moving on, is if you can begin to, dis to describe and make meaning out of an experience. And given the kinds of experiences that people are dealing with, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that we would have to carefully attend to as we adapt this for other circumstances. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. Yeah. And I would just add, you know, to what you're yeah. saying, that it's, you know, that uh, putting words to and understanding that what you experience now may have may have a longer history, yes. um, depending on who you are and what your, you know, sort of what your other life, your, your own life sort of trajectory has been uh, and where you've come from. So if you're a recent immigrant or if you are... Um, you know, or and also what community means. You mm -hmm. know, because it actually is not just location. It has, uh, it has, it. The, many of the people that we work with, including, you know, I'm from Denmark, so my family was very significant, significantly affected, even though they were in Denmark, by the events of 9/11 too. So having that, having a very sort of open understanding of both what the events means, what it, what it, what it um, builds on. Uh, where, or where it may be triggering for other, you know, experiences from the past, and so being very co co cognizant of that, as uh, as a person trying to help put words to what happens, as Ellen is saying. Yeah. yeah. So it enables people to kind of process, right, right. the experience, right. and uh, and then hopefully move to that uh, next stage. So the so. Uh, with regard to trauma, the, the first stage is safety, right? And then moving to healing and processing. And then? Sort of moving, being able to move on to, you know, to move along in the one's life as opposed to being stuck, yeah. which is, I think, a, a lot of what happens with people who get very stuck with grieving and, and it's difficult to yeah. move beyond that. Um, and I know people are still dealing with this. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I just uh, also getting to the resiliency as you're yeah. talking about that. Yeah. That what we thought a lot about with people uh, was around sort of this whole idea of self-care. Um, but we we learned from our communities uh, or the communities that we were uh, we worked with that it actually it's not just taking care of yourself, but it's also taking care of your community. And mm -hmm. and so we we try to think about well, how, what do, what do you do to do both, right? And for many people, it's helping others helps to help themselves. For people, so there's a lot of different meaning around what does care mean. How do you build resiliency within your community mm -hmm. uh, and strengthening the community to be able to, um, you know, know what to do if something should happen again in the future to keep yourself and your community and your family safe. Mm -hmm. So, um, receiving care, but also providing care, right? Right. right. And, and allowing oneself to receive and give. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other sources of strength and hope that people can tap into that you can think of? Well, I think the, the, the other piece that I think was so significant, and I mentioned that before, was the around um, really being very observant or reflective of your own experience as a helper or participating mm -hmm. in the help in that process. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really one of the big takeaway lessons. So now we teach that in social work school, right? Yeah. Self-care, we call it, you right. know. Uh, we tell people how to be mindful, you know. So a lot of the things that I think we learned then, mm -hmm. we didn't we didn't do that then as social workers. We yeah. didn't, you know, we, we, we just, we worked. We didn't really think so much about the impact. We didn't have that. We had, there was the people that we help and then there was us, you know, but it really became a we experience, mm. right? So that is what the community um, okay. you know, kind of means. Well, yeah. again, putting the social in social work, yeah. right? <laughs> so i um, like to see if, uh, if we've got any questions. Um, uh, from the audience. Um, okay, working with local communities is one of the strongest and greatest things I've done in my life. How can someone back here in Africa partner with you to do research and implementation of these interventions? Okay, 
Wow, that's a great question. And I, I agree with the, what, is, what was the first part? Uh, working with local communities is one of the strongest and greatest yeah. things I've done in my life. I, I would underline that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we would be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, I don't know where you are in Africa, but um, I've, yeah, there are many ways to use psychoeducation and cross-culturally. Um, and, uh, and working with, as we said, how do you, how you think about what that means for your culture and, and right. thinking about how that you might be able to adapt that, so, yeah. And drawing from your experience, working with community partners, right, and, and how that could, right. yeah. It's a really participatory process, mm -hmm. uh, and it takes some time, but it's, uh, but it's a wonderful uh, knowledge exchange, as we mentioned before. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, next question. Was there a greater sense of community in New York City after 9-11, and did this help your intervention? The sense of communi community after September 11th was, was overwhelmingly positive. People, the, the buses were free, people were uh, giving each other rides, families taking other families into their apartments. I mean, it was, it was striking. And you know, people were making millions, literally millions, I think, of sandwiches mm -hmm. for the rescue workers. Mm -hmm. um, it, there was a great sense of community, and initially a lot of chaos as well. Yeah. So, I think the and and I think also the the experience of um, have, having this experience as a as a community, you know, brought uh, you know, brought people together. Um, uh, but there, uh, and I think there was a lot of hope in those initial months uh, afterwards. And I think for the country to kind of coming together and the world kind of looking to help us, you know, um, that was really what what was striking to me is how much people reached out to us. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I remember particularly is, is that uh, from Holland they sent all these tulip bolts mm -hmm. that um, were planted. Um, in various parks, uh, and you know, so you got a bag of tulips, and you pat, you know, so you planted them uh, as a community, and that was sort of a, a wonderful kind of um, sense of like that we were not alone, uh, that people listened to, uh, heard what had happened, and they reached out to try to help us too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, got an, one last question. I was very moved by what you said about how people are still working through these issues 18 years after the event. Is help still available for them, or are they on their own? That's a great question. I mean, it happens that my daughter is one of those people, so it's now 18 years later. She was 14 at the time. Uh, and she's, she's really struggled both with physical symptoms and emotional symptoms. She's been in therapy. She's done a lot of uh, body work and very interested in and has become very committed to trauma work on her as a result of her own healing process. Mm -hmm. But that's just one person. I mean, many people are also affected in very serious ways by the physical aftermath of being rescue workers. And right. I know John Stewart has advocated on their behalf. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it has a lot of, I think, uh, uh, effects sort of that reverberates, I think, throughout. And I think on a date like today, I think I'm sort of glad, we, I'm so glad that we are doing this because it reminds us that we probably still have a lot of work to do. Right. Um, and true. to think about, and as people have and other traumas sort of roll in, and we all are witness to that, so uh, almost every day, um, either physical, you know, um, you know, any kind of natural disasters or other disasters in communities, you know, they, it just behooves us to keep thinking about how we can kind of help people uh, or think about this with people so that we can uh, be more stronger as, co as communities or as a community. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and uh, again, uh, um, you know, while we wouldn't want to take anything away from people dealing with um, the various medical conditions as a result of being first responders. Um, I think we need to draw attention to some of the psychological sequelae um, of 9-11 uh, and uh, how best to support those people. Um, and, the, and many other tragedies that are occurring here and around the world yeah, in terms of the sequelae that last for many, many years.
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I'd like to thank you both, Dr. Lukens and Dr. Torning, um, for joining me here today at Social Impact Live. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, we will be joined next week by Zach Parolin, a postdoc at the School of Social Work's Poverty Center uh, to discuss the U.S. welfare system and racial inequality. So I hope to see you then. All right? Thanks, and goodbye.